Hey everybody, welcome back to the Big Tire Garage. If you're new here, I'd like to say go ahead, hit that subscribe button down below so you can keep up with all the video content that we've got coming out this year. Now today's video is about this bad boy right here. This is what I would consider to be one of the best upgrades for a Jeep JK owner who's looking for that middle of the road solution. They don't want to go full one tons, but they don't want to have to worry about their rear axle when they're doing some mild off-roading or some overlanding. But before we get into that axle, let's go ahead, grab a cup of coffee. This axle is the Curry HD60 semi-float rear Dana 60 axle specifically designed for the Jeep JK. Normally when you order this axle, it will show up ready to install in a satin black powder coat, but I asked them to send me a bare housing so we could see the inside of what makes this axle such a great option. Plus, it'll give me a chance to show you how to set up a Yukon gear and axle ring and pinion and 40 spline grizzly locker in any Dana 60 axle. The tools that we're going to be using in our video today are from our video sponsor Craftsman, in particular the new Craftsman low profile ratchet. Now the head on the low profile ratchet is up to 25% thinner than other ratchets with the same drive size. Add to the fact that it's a fine tooth ratchet. This makes working in tight places easy. The ratchet is a full polish chrome finish to prevent corrosion and makes it very easy to clean. You can pick the low profile toolkit up at any Craftsman retailer. And of course, it's backed by a full lifetime warranty. I'll put a link in the description below to the kit that I've started to throw in my off-road rigs. It's their 159 piece SAE metric low profile setup. It's gonna have everything that you're gonna need when you're out on the trail. I stripped this axle down to a bare housing for a couple of reasons. First of all, I wanted to basically set it up correctly because everything was just mocked up into place when we filmed with this axle on my TV show, Four Wheeler. But right now I wanna basically assemble it for good. I also wanted you to be able to see the inner workings of this axle, to see what makes it so much better than the stock JK Dana 44 that's underneath the back. It's not just the fact that it's a Dana 60 gear set. There are a lot more upgrades even in the housing itself. So this rear axle is a direct bolt in for the JK or the JKU and it has a wheel mounting width of 65.375, which is basically stock width. As I said before, it's a heavy duty 60 series low pinion, so the ring and pinion are much stronger. And the axle shafts that come in the housing are 40 spline chrome mollies. Now this is two and a half times stronger than the stock shaft. The axle bearings are massive set 80 axle bearings. Now these are much larger than the factory set 10 bearings, which makes them stronger and able to handle more abuse off-road. All the brackets are in the stock location and they're heavy duty thick material. It has a nodular iron center section and a nodular iron differential cover, upgrades it to a 1350 pinion yoke, but it still retains the stock five on five wheel bolt pattern and the entire factory JK rear brake components. And that's what makes this axle so easy to install. Now I use a term in this video that some Jeep owners might find triggering. And that term is mild off-road Jeep. Now when I say mild build, I'm really not referring to the parts that are on the Jeep. I'm referring to how the Jeep is used. So for myself, a mild build Jeep like this JK that looks like a two-door Gladiator, that's exactly what it's built for. To drive to and from the trail, stay out of the buggy stuff because I don't want any body damage, 
and maybe, you know, just bomb the occasional fire road, go camping with my family. It's not a dedicated rock crawler. If I have one of those, guess what? It's on a trailer being trailered to the trail because I plan to do some serious off-roading with that vehicle. I'm not a fan of trail ratings because I think the number means something different to everybody else. But in my opinion, if we look at the Onyx off-road app, I would say anything from a seven and down, you could put a mildly built Jeep onto that trail and have tons of fun. But that doesn't limit your off-road experience. You can hit a bunch of trails in Johnson Valley where they race King of the Hammers. You could do a bunch of stuff in Moab, Utah, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Tennessee. You can still do some pretty serious wheeling with a mild off-road Jeep build. Yes, one ton swaps are great. And there's so many different versions of those one ton swaps out there that it actually has become quite economical to buy a set of one tons front and rear for a Jeep JK. But it's not just the axles. The axles are like the first domino that's gonna fall in a long line of dominoes after you plan that one ton swap. You get the axles underneath there. Well, now the question becomes, uh, do your brakes have enough power to deal with the larger calipers that are on those one ton axles? Is your steering correct for a one ton swap or do you need to completely upgrade all the steering in your Jeep now? Obviously you're gonna need new drive shafts at that point, so now you gotta get all new drive shafts for the vehicle. And then add to the fact that now that you've got one tons, you're losing a little bit of ground clearance, you're probably gonna want larger tires and then probably the most important thing is when you do the one ton swap, those wheels that you already bought for your Jeep that you're in love with, guess what? They're not gonna fit on those one ton axles. You gotta get all new wheels for your rig. Those are the additional expenses that people sometimes don't look at. That's why for a mild off-road Jeep build, the Semi-Float 60 is a great option. It deals with all the weak links in the factory axle, stronger housing, better bracketry, stronger ring and pinion, stronger axle shafts, but at the same time, it lets me save money elsewhere. I can keep the wheels and tires that were already on the Jeep. The factory brakes bolt right back up. Even the e-brake cables are gonna work. Nothing to worry about at all with this swap. It's the perfect axle, in my opinion, for a mildly built Jeep JK. So our axle housing now has a nice good coat of flat black paint. I like to use just aerosol spray can paint on anything that's underneath my vehicle because this is gonna get hit with rocks and stuff when it's on the trail and it's gonna be a lot easier just to touch it up with some of that aerosol spray paint. Now the first step in setting up this gear set is gonna be to set our pinion depth and that's done one of two ways. It's either a shim underneath that bearing race down in the housing or it is a shim that goes in between the bearing and the pinion head, one of those two areas. And what we're doing is, we've showed you this before, we're basically setting the distance where the pinion head is gonna rest on the ring gear. Now, we've done this before by using the, um, the suggestions in the Yukon instructions that come with the gear set. And nine times out of 10 gets you perfect every single time. This time I'm gonna show you how to actually measure for that shim using a pinion depth checking tool. This is what your pinion depth checking tool is gonna to look like. It's gonna consist of pucks that are gonna go in to where your side bearings mount inside the housing, a cross shaft that holds a dial indicator, and then inside these metal tubes right here are three different tips that screw into the bottom of the dial indicator, depending on what type of axle you're doing. Now, this is a Dana 60, so it'll be pretty simple. We'll just follow the instructions in here and it'll tell us what extension and what target plate to use. What we'll do then is install it into the actual differential carrier. We'll put the pinion in place. And what we're essentially doing is we are measuring the distance from the top of that pinion head to the center line of the axle. Okay, so here's how the math breaks down when you're doing the pinion depth checker. So with the pinion depth tool in the housing, we took the measurement off the top of the pinion head while it was sitting in its race, and we got a measurement of 0.253 of an inch. Now you reference your instructions and it will tell you that if you have the long extension tip 
in the dial indicator, your base measurement is gonna start at 3.375. So you take the 3.375, you subtract the measurement that you get from inside the housing, 0.253, and that gives you a measured pinion depth of 3.122. Now, sometimes the pinion depth will actually be inscribed onto the pinion head, uh, but this one is not. But if it's not, not to worry. The next step is you then refer to your instructions again, and you're gonna come up with the main housing depth. So the main housing depth on a Dana 60 is 5.000. Then what you do is you measure the size of the actual pinion head. You see, it's a set of calipers. And in this case, it was 1.823 of an inch. So that means I have from the 5.000, I subtract 1.823. That leaves me with 3.177. That is the measured pinion depth. This is the actual pinion depth. You simply subtract the two and that is the thickness of your shim. In this case, it is 0 0.055. And that is how you use a pinion depth checking tool to determine the depth of your pinion and how thick your master pinion shim has to be. So I'm gonna slip a 0 0.055 shim onto here, press the bearing on and we can start assembly. The next thing we're going to set up is our pinion bearing rotational load. Once again, rotational load is basically the pressure between these two tapered roller bearings on the pinion. We're essentially going to assemble it into the axle, tighten down the nut, and then measure the amount of load it takes to turn it. And we want rotational load on these bearings so they stay good and tight as the axle breaks in. Now, some Dana 60s from the factory actually used a crush sleeve, and other ones were like this, where you basically had the pinion head with almost a built-in crush sleeve eliminator and some shims that would go between the bearing and the pinion itself. Now, most manufacturers now produce their pinions like this, so even if you had a crush sleeve in the axle, if you were changing the gear set, it would more than likely eliminate it like this setup is here. The problem is, most of the time, what I would do is I would measure the factory shim pack that came out of the axle or just throw it back in, or I would measure the crush sleeve to come up with some sort of base measurement to determine how many shims I need to put in there to start with, I'd check the rotational load, and then adjust from there. But because I'm starting with a bare housing, I basically have to just start with a shot in the dark, assemble the pinion, measure it, and see what happens. Chances are I'm going to be taking this pinion in and out of this axle housing multiple times. The finished rotational load on this axle ended up being right at about 22 and a half inch pounds of rotational load. Now the spec for this axle is actually 17 to 30 inch pounds of rotational load with brand new bearings. I kind of danced around a lot. I kept getting like a 15 and then I'd add a few thousandths and I'd get a 50. So I just had to really fine tooth that shim pack. I think I ended up with 82 thousandths of an inch worth of shims in between the two bearings and I'm really happy with this rotational load right now. I like to set up my axles just a little bit tighter because of the additional torque that comes with when you put these things in four low, it puts a lot of pressure on those bearings. Now I can pull this yoke off, put the pinion seal in, and at that point we're ready to move on to the carrier.
So essentially what I've done here is I have dropped the carrier into the housing and I pushed it all the way to one side away from the pinion. And then I measured the distance between the bearing race and the edge of the housing. And that ended up being 75 thousandths of an inch. Then I started adding shims on the pinion side of the carrier between the bearing and the housing, just extra shims that had laying around. Basically dropped them in there until the ring gear was close enough to the pinion that I ended up with the required backlash that I need between six and 10 thousandths of an inch. So what I'll do now is I'll take it all back apart. I'll measure that shim pack. All these shims will go between the bearing and the locker because they're so thin. There's no way that I'm gonna be able to hammer these you know, 10,000 thick shims in here and obtain a good amount of carrier bearing preload. So I'm gonna pull it all apart, put the shims between the locker and the bearings. So that means pulling the bearings off, pressing them back on, and then we'll reassemble it, check it all again. If it's good, we're good. If it's not, once again, we gotta take it all back apart. Oh, it's so heavy. So at this point right here, if the shim pack is correct, the carrier should not drop back into the housing very easily because we wanna have carrier bearing preload. So that means I run between five and 10 thousandths of an inch worth of preload. So I calculated the total number of shims, calculated the number of shims that needed to be on this side to obtain the proper backlash. And then I've gone ahead and put the opposite number on this side right here. So just so you know, the numbers in this setup are um, total number of shims was uh, 0.075. I needed 32 thousandths to obtain proper backlash. And then I needed 43 thousandths on the opposite side to pick up for the 32. And then I added seven thousandths of an inch. So I have 50 thousandths on this side and then 32 on this side. So you can see the carrier can't just drop into the housing. Now, there's two ways to install this carrier. One way is to get a dead blow hammer, biggest hammer you have, and just start wailing on that carrier and get it to go into the housing. And that is an acceptable way to do it. A lot of people do it that way. There's nothing really wrong with it. Um, I do that 99.9% .9 of the time. But I wanted to show you another tool that you don't see used too often, and that is what's called a case spreader. So this is what a case spreader looks like. The case spreaders are used in a lot of the Dana series axles because of the fact that the shims go between the bearing and the locker. So you can't hammer the shims in in between the bearing and the housing. You just can't do it. So you get to a, a situation like this. That's why Danas have these little holes cast into the housing right here and right here. These are not to be welded up. These are important. Every Dana has them. Dana 30 all the way up to Dana 80s have these. The case spreader is gonna index off these holes and essentially what it's gonna do is it's just basically gonna pull the case apart and allow this to drop in. You don't wanna just go crazy with the case spreader. <laughs> you only wanna spread that housing probably about five thousandths of an inch, just enough to get that carrier to drop in then you take the pressure off and then we'll go ahead and check our backlash. It just makes, in this case, it's the best way to do it because I'm not 100% certain that those shims on the backlash side are correct. There is a chance I'm gonna have to take this carrier in and out a couple times, pull those bearings on and off. And it just makes getting the carrier in and out of the housing a lot easier. So what I'll do right now, is I'll set the case spreader up, start spreading that case out, drop this carrier in.
little bit more. With the pattern checked, I am very happy with it. You can see basically it's basically sort of centered on the tooth. It might be getting a little bit close to uh, the inside of the tooth, but if we go around to the coast side, it's almost the exact opposite and it's actually finishing on the tooth on this side. Now, depending on the gear ratio, it doesn't always mean you're gonna get a tooth pattern contact that basically starts and stops on the full tooth on both sides of the axle. And as I've always said, if you have a question about what is considered a good tooth pattern, you can go ahead and just consult the book that comes with your gear set. You can see here, this is pretty much, I don't have that, I kind of have that right there. That's kind of where I'm at. I'm kind of shallow on the drive side, closer to the heel on the coast side, which is, this is perfect pattern for what we've got here. A lot of the time getting that perfect pattern with these deep gear ratios, that pattern is like centered right on the tooth on both the heat, uh, drive and the coast side, it's very difficult. Especially when we're into a set of like 538s like we have here. It's very, very low ratio, and therefore the pinion head is incredibly small. So you're not, you're gonna fight a lot if you keep trying to get that pattern centered specifically on the tooth. This pattern, I'm super happy with. I've seen this pattern before in the past, and I know it's gonna be good and quiet. So that's it. We've now set up the gear set. We've installed the locker. We use the case spreader. We have the proper pinion bearing preload. Now I can go ahead and finish building this axle. Finishing this axle out with a set of power stop brakes. This is their JK Big Brake Kit. I really like this package because you get these oversized rotors front and rear, but it still re retains the factory caliper. It's just a taller, basically, caliper bridge that pushes the caliper out to accept that larger rotor. Looks really good. Uh, one piece of advice I'll give you if you have a JK, these bolts that hold the caliper bridge on are known for loosening off. And you can actually see there's a little bit of Loctite on them from the factory. When you take them on and off multiple times, that Loctite obviously doesn't work anymore. So before you install these, always put just a little bit of blue Loctite on these bolts before you tighten them down because when these loosen off, and it's, it's a regular thing, I don't know why, I think it might just be the vibration of the brakes. What happens is that usually just one falls out and then the caliper starts flopping over and I've seen them punch holes into wheels. So I'm gonna put some Loctite on these and tighten them down. The brakes on this axle is 100% done. Uh, I think this is a great option 
for a mild built Jeep JK like the one that it's going in up there on 37s that isn't a hardcore rock crawler. I still keep those factory wheel and tire bolt pattern, basically factory brakes on the back even though I upgraded them, but I have the strength of that Dana 60 uh, center section ring and pinion. I now have a mechanical locker in the back and I have those upgraded axle tubes and the thicker brackets in the factory locations. Pretty much solves all the problems that happen with the factory Jeep JK axle. I probably should have put new backing plates on it, but Ah, uh, they'll be fine for now. They still do their job, even though they look a little bit rusty. So there you go. All I have left to do is basically stab this axle back underneath the Jeep.